and I hope that I will be able to help you today to see what's happening. And five years from now, the word is this won't be any big deal. But right now, there is a lot of excitement and uh, a lot of kind of breakthrough things happening as it rela as relates to volunteers. So let's take a look and see what's happening. This is one of my favorite quotes. I love this quote. It's riding the horse in the direction it's going. And I know that you all have many of these moments in the work that you do. It's not just about volunteers, but it's like what's happening and, and are we going in that direction or are we, you know, that whole change piece, are we kind of digging our heels in or not knowing which direction we're going to end up in. And so I hope to be able to give you the direction so you know which way to ride. All right. So in any organization, and I understand that many of you are in organizations that have existed since the 1800s. So you have a long legacy of service. Um, some of you are brand new. You know, I talked with the gentleman last night, Aaron, from Palm Beach, who's starting up. And so there, you're in different phases throughout the organizational life cycle. But in working with a lot of organizations like I have been recently, especially in hospitals, we're seeing that there, there's something's happening. <laughs> you know, you've had a successful organization or you've utilized volunteers very successfully and then something's happening and you're seeing a decline in the, the people that you used to be able to recruit that you are not finding anymore. Uh, some of you are saying, no, that's not happening. But for a lot of folks, it's changing. And it may not be a decline, but if you don't address some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about, you may see that things start going this direction. So what I'm proposing is a turnaround strategy. And I'd like to know how many of you would say that you've peaked and you may be seeing, you may be nervous about what's happening next and or you're in decline. Please raise your hand so I can see. Okay, so the rest of you, things are going well. No, kind of? All right. So I'm not trying to, you know, say that it has to be bad. I'm just saying let's get prepared so that it doesn't. All right? So what we have been seeing in the world of volunteer engagement over the last 50 to 60 years, we've been able to do these little minor tweaks and tuning, you know, carefully, uh, but it doesn't require a lot of change in how we behave or our attitude toward volunteers or how we recruit them. We don't have to change job descriptions or position descriptions that much. But now we need to start thinking about radical. Um, we need to be thinking about significant. And it means that we have to look at things differently. You know, our beliefs about something, um, our values about what volunteers can and can't do how we bring them on board, how we recruit them, and what kind of relationships we have with volunteers because it's going to be required. Who volunteers? Well, for me, having done a lot of work on the boomer side, I was uh, worked with Temple University out of Philadelphia on an initiative that was funded by the federal government. And believe it or not, the feds <laughs> felt that it was really important to invest in this information because it affects community nonprofits and organizations everywhere. And so some of this material is from my time with Temple. And one of the things we really looked at was, who are these folks? And by generation, we all have different values. We all have different music we resonate to and historical things that happen. If you watch CNN, you're getting to re-experience the 60s all over again, right? And so that generation, my generation, we're, we were radicalized, many of us, uh, by world events. And we're coming in as highly skilled, oftentimes highly skilled professionals or people with work histories. We are now looking to volunteer. And we're not necessarily finding what we want. And I could give you several personal examples of knocking on doors and being rejected. And I don't want to go there, but I'm not the only one that this is happening to. And so um, we've got different generations coming up. And the GI generation, they're pretty much not volunteering anymore. I worked at Methodist Hospital in San Antonio a couple of years ago as a director of volunteers for five hospitals. 
And I had 95 year olds working, but they were the rare exception and some of them could run my legs off. But um, so the generation, the GI generation, this is the group that actually uh, formed a lot of our values about volunteering. We have not really changed the way we look at volunteerism. And these are the folks that started a lot of what we now inherit. And I want you to go back and look, if you will, at when those folks were born. You know, the formative years for that generation was the early 1900s. And I'm saying to you that because of that generation, we formed what volunteerism looks like, and we haven't really changed it. And so now, if we march forward into the year 2013, my generation, you know, is coming, and we have a whole nother wave of folks. I have a millennial um, son who has his own way of doing things, and we don't necessarily see what we're looking for. Okay, so the way it was structured, you will make a regular ongoing commitment. You'll work X number of hours per week. That's the way it was set up. We will recognize you based on hours of service. And in the hospital world, the, out, the pins, if you've ever been to an auxiliary, they would wear them and you know they would drag the ground. Um, we had highly defined roles. It was like, I got a job description. I knew my marching orders. I had somebody who could supervise me and answer all my questions. And that's pretty much it. it didn't require rocket scientists. I was it was something that could be easily, uh, you could train for. So you didn't have to have a lot of skill going in. But now what's happening is you've got a world of folks who say, I want choice. And if I don't see it, and you're not willing to negotiate with me on this, I'm going to go volunteer in one of those other jillion nonprofits in your community. Um, the short-term commitment. People are not willing to make long-term commitments necessarily. They're, they're still there. I'm not going to say not. I'm going to say both and. It's about how do we create both structures. So yes, there are people who will still make long-term commitments, but there are a lot that won't. And so do we have a way of onboarding people who don't necessarily want to make that commitment? Can they still contribute? to your organization, but on a project basis. So if you think about the projects that you have, you know, would you let somebody come in for three or four months and work on something and then off they go? And I'm going to help you hopefully figure out what that might look like. They want it meaningful. And meaning's in the eye of the beholder. And people are looking for what's in it for me. That's a WIFM, a W-I-I-F-M. How will I benefit by working with you? And how will you benefit? What's the return on investment that you're going to get by my being involved? We don't necessarily want to be directed. We don't want to necessarily be micromanaged. And I'm saying there will always be people who will want that. But if your style of management does not allow for this creativity and self-direction and all of the things that I've been talking about, I'm going to go somewhere else to volunteer. And you're going to have um, you know, more and more limited numbers of volunteers. So today's institutions, as we all know, all you have to do is turn on the TV. It's everywhere. Everything is changing and it's happening at such a fast pace. A lot of people are having a hard time holding on. You know, even the nature of work has changed and we're looking at people who now may work part-time or flex time, they share jobs. They, I am a, a consultant as a, a worker. I work out of my home, uh, but I'm going to be in Chicago next week on a project in Kansas some other week. So I have some flexibility within my schedule um, to do volunteer work and what I do when I have the time is my dog and I go and we do pet therapy. But the way it's structured is that I can pick and choose my time and I have found the perfect place where I just say I'm coming. 
and there's not a lot of restriction on my having to do X number of hours per month or week or whatever. So people are intermittent in how they work. They telecommute. And in my world, I call it virtual volunteering. So if you think about the people that could potentially be supporting your organizations, do you have anybody that is a virtual worker? Does anybody have an example of what that might look like? I'm in Austin, and because of my skills and talent, I am supporting you virtually in the work that you're doing. Anybody? Tell me what, you're, what that looks like. Um, I'm the tech guy that um, does our web page and any of our IT stuff remotely. Um, so we just you know, send him a message, this is what we've been doing. And is he in your community? Okay, and um, so for example, if I were in New Zealand, but I had the skills to do that work, would I be able to do it for you virtually? Yeah. So our world is getting bigger and bigger in terms of the potential for support. Who else has an example? Yes. Um, we have a newsletter editor. We, have, we write a quarterly newsletter, and she's a snowbird. Um, and when she's traveled, when she's back in the north, um, for the for the summer, she works out of her home or on the boat or whatever on uh, the computer and uh, does our newsletters. Okay, so when she travels from north to south or vice versa, she's still volunteering for you, correct? Send the proof over to our printer and that. All right. So those are two really, really good examples of what this world looks like. So if we begin mirroring what volunteers can do based on this world that many of them are currently working in or have worked in, it opens up a whole new uh, picture of how we can recruit. Now, I know that a lot of you are using volunteers as visitors and working in your centers. You know, and you do need those warm bodies and you need them to be committed. But I've heard of vacation volunteers coming in from other countries to help on some of your missions, uh, uh, centers, I'm sorry. So, you know, it, it's happening in your world. It's just a matter of now let's start identifying it and begin to think strategically about how it might work for your particular organization. So my goal today is to get you, if nothing else, to hopefully come up with one idea that's out of the box for you, all right? So what we're also facing is a, a word that was coined many, many years ago, and I think it's very appropriate, time poverty. The reason people aren't volunteering, they will say many times, is that they don't have enough time. Have you heard that? Oh, I don't know if I can commit. I don't think I have enough time. And if the perception of the work that I would do for any of your organizations is that it requires a lot of time, Given my current situation, I would have to say no. So how do we break down the perception that I can't be a volunteer because it's going to take too much time? Where do I find out about your volunteer opportunities? How do I find you? Anybody? Where, where would I look for you? Because you're the best kept secret in the whole world. How do I find you? I know that there's some YouTube uh, videos available, but I had to be directed to them. I had to have the link for them. Anybody? Okay. I know, but I understand. So it's project based and it may or may not be attractive to certain people. The question is, how do I find you? How do I learn about you and your community? Yes. All right, so through presentations. If I, if I don't happen to be at that presentation, how do I find out about your volunteer program opportunities? So that's wonderful, yes. Get your name on volunteer databases. Right. And, and you know what? The boomer generation, believe it or not, we're very tech savvy. And a lot of the boomer generation is looking for you online. And that seems somewhat counterintuitive, but I'm almost 65 and I'm very computer savvy and that's where I go to do everything. So if I'm looking and I don't find you, 
if I find your website but I don't learn about the volunteer opportunities that you have, you've missed a huge opportunity. There's a, 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 a software, pro, uh, I'm sorry, a recruiting site called Vol, uh, Volunteer Match. Everybody, it's like, you know, the rock star for finding volunteers online. And it's free. So, you know, I think it's free for you to post X number of opportunities. You can put pictures up there. If I'm searching by, de you know, demographics, by the type of service of visiting or whatever, it will come up. And you can say it doesn't matter if you live in my community or not. Depending on the job, if it's a webmaster, they don't necessarily have to be in your community. So you can manipulate the search engine to match your needs. Volunteermatch.com. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource. On my website, which is my name, I have a links page. And on that links page, I have broken out all kinds of resources, including recruitment sites. There are more. Idealist.org. There are a number of sites that will, you know, help you. But you have to be really smart about writing the description and making it interesting and making it, if I can say so, as flexible as possible for volunteers to help you for all the reasons that we've talked about. You know, and people are not committing to long-term projects. They, are, they might, if you, you know, but it may not be sustained for years and years and years. Like, I had a volunteer named Dottie in Methodist who had worked 80,000 volunteer hours. She worked more than most employees who had retired from that organization. <laughs> and she was still active and engaged, and it was her life. But that's becoming more and more rare. So what is it that I'm going to get if I come to volunteer for you? How do you define the benefits of being a volunteer in your organization? So anybody want to tell me? You're recruiting me. What do I get? Tell me. What can I be assured of? What will I learn? Do you see? Anybody, be brave. Tell me, what am I going to learn? Yes. What will I get back? The way I approach people coming in is uh, it's kind of like joining the Army. You get the adventure. You're going to see the world, except you're going to see it from one location in your community. Right. You're going to get to experience different ethnic uh, uh, and, and, and traditions and, and, and habits. Else. Right, and so that's a kind of pithy, that's what I want to see. And if you're not good at stating that, we're going to talk about finding a volunteer to help you craft your message and help you brand the organization in a way that re you know, will reach people of all generations and cultures. All right, so we have, as you can see now, a, what I call a changing paradigm. We have traditional volunteering, which will never, ever go away. But now we're looking at how do we create volunteer opportunities for people who are skillful and who are considered pro bono consultants. The world of, um, as we know, it, lawyers are the, the masters of pro bono. They are, it's part of their culture. It's part of their licensing and expectation. But the goal is now that every profession begins to own that value of pro bono contribution. And we're seeing more and more and more of it. And so what's happening is we're going from hands-on volunteering, which would be visiting on the ships or working in your center, to how do we get help you, what I call build capacity within the organization to grow it, to find more resources, to find more support, more volunteers, we need to start looking at this whole other side, which is project-oriented and skills-based. Any questions about this? I don't want to lose anybody, because this is critical right here. Yes? The comment, and I forget this often myself, because I just do. When I'm thinking about volunteers, I'm thinking about our project volunteers, and I tend to forget that Everybody on my board is a volunteer. Exactly. And they fall into that skilled area and bring something specific to the table. Absolutely. Board members are volunteers too. Is your the volunteer.com, does that go to the pro bono too, or is that more 
I'm going to give you some resources for pro bono and skill based. You're going to leave here with more than you probably want to know. A good question. Any other questions at this point? Don't want to lose you here. And I know some of you are already doing it. This is not new to you. All right, so I'm going to have you look at something that's been very helpful to me. I call it my field of dreams graph. And what I would be looking for if I were coming in as a consultant to your organization is to see how many check marks you have. So for example, if I'm going to be providing direct service to the seaman, can I do it one time? Could I be involved occasionally, you know, because I travel? Can I come in maybe every couple of months when you're having a special event? Uh, could I do it short term for three or four months? Or do I have to do it ongoing? And so I would ask you to look at each of these categories and say, how many of these check marks do we have? So if it's an indirect service to the seaman, what might that look like? Administrative support, um, it could be, you know, special event behind the scenes, uh, raising, you know, silent auction items. There's so many different ways that we can approach supporting the organization. Advocacy, it might be public speaking and talking to your community and your legislators and, you know, the folks that have influence. Administrative support and technical, which is the webmaster. Uh, it might be having a, a group of folks that will, you know, you can call and say, my printer is so jammed, I'll never get out of this, can you come over? That would be occasional. It could be, you know, I might call you once every year when the printer jams, but I just need to know I can call you, right? The managerial professional is what we've been talking about uh, a lot of thus far, and then your governance board development stuff. Any questions about this graph? And how many check marks do you think you could have right now? Are you going to have this available to us also through the... It's already been sent to everyone on PDF. Any questions? Because if you don't build this, I may not come. Do you see? And so the reason I put the check marks over on to ongoing is because most organizations limit where volunteers can work and they require regular ongoing commitment. And so we've got to break this thing up into pieces. And uh, then the challenge with that is when you've got people who are short-term episodic volunteers, it takes more supervision, right? You have to have more people, which requires more of your time. And I'm saying that you need to start thinking about volunteers who can lead other volunteers. You don't have to do this. You can have a team leader. You could have somebody who could train new volunteers. You don't have to do it all. And I call it, and Sharon and I have had this discussion, it's called the Lone Ranger mentality. If you want a job done right, what's the answer? Do it yourself. Do it yourself. And here, I'm, I'm in 30 minutes into this, we know the answer is do it yourself, right? We can't keep doing it because you can't focus on the future if you're stuck doing the day-to-day -day stuff. And you guys are, a lot of you are the execs and the leaders of your organization. So you've got to be able to move forward so that you can build and sustain your organization. All right, I'm gonna give you about two, two or three minutes. I want you to get a sense of what this is like. So just on a piece of paper, I'd like for you to just very quickly write down three or four tasks that you do on a regular, ongoing basis. And this is, if you, you know, we're not going to get done with this, this is homework, but I want you to know where I'm going with this, all right? So write down some tasks that you do on a regular, ongoing basis, two, three or four. And when you get back, I want you to make, add about eight or nine or ten, and I'm sure you have plenty. Okay, so stop. Again, this is homework. You, you know where you're going with this, right? Now, the next question is, what is it that you've been dreaming about 
in your perfect world, you would uh, have this accomplished. And Aaron is going to tell me what your big dream is, Aaron. One of them. You've got lots. <laughs> uh, well, the big dream is actually establishing the seafarer's house initially. And an actual building, brick and mortar, right? Okay, so that would be what he would put as a dream that he has. So what is your dream for your organization? It might be to diversify your volunteer pool. It might be, you know, to have better outreach and marketing so people know you're there. It might be to raise ten thousand, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars. So write it down. I think mine would be more awareness in the community. Okay. The Center. Right. So write it down. Okay. Write whatever it is. So for Sharon, it's better awareness. And I wouldn't put more than one or two there. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, what would you like to learn in your job? For me, it was always, I wish I could be in the master of Excel spreadsheets. You know? I'm still not there. But I do know there are templates online that will do some of it for me. <laughs> so what would you like to learn? A skill. And finally, the PS stands for pleasant surprise. I don't know until that person shows up if I really need them. And this has happened to me before, where somebody walks in my door and it's like, you're the answer to my prayer, and I didn't even know I had the prayer going out. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at what you would do with this list. So once you've created your big, long task list, I want you to think about if the right person with the right skills showed up, I'd turn this over to them in a heartbeat. I need photographs for my social networking page and for my newsletter. My son's got a $10,000 camera and a degree in film and photography. Would you let him take that over? Yes, of course. That's what we're talking about. It's a no-brainer. I don't need to be doing this. If the right person with the right skills showed up, would you be willing to work with them as a team <coughs> member? They're they're a volunteer. I'm going to need to supervise and delegate. And I know a lot of you are already doing that. Many of you have very robust volunteer staff. The question, uh, the circle is, I love it, or I have to do it. It's required in my job, and I'm going to have to keep this one. Can't delegate it, can't give it away. And finally, I'll think about it. The right person with the right skills hasn't shown up. I can't imagine that they would, but if they do, I'm willing to think about giving some of what I have on my plate to somebody else, all right? So when I start, started thinking about building the capacity of the organization, I started thinking about the fact that we often have people we need to have raise money, we have volunteers, but now I'm saying the third leg of the stool has arrived and it's going to sit a whole lot better if we figure out how to use it. Pro bono and skills-based volunteering, let me say, is the broad term for this new world. Pro bono is a piece of it. And these are folks who donate professional services to advance the public good. And it's a time-honored tradition. And there are more and more people that are doing it. I have done pro bono consulting before. You know, there are all of us out there are doing it, you know, everywhere. Going back to that traditional versus pro bono, if you can look, hands-on volunteering versus skills-based volunteering. Example, park cleanup, mentoring students too, the IT, the graphic design, the coaching, uh, strategic planning. There are people that will donate strategic planning services to organizations. Uh, my partner does that. All right, so let's take a look then at how people have been using pro bono. And the most, as you can imagine, is legal, because that's been the time-honored tradition. But marketing, HR, financial, administrative, and all the way down, you can see where more and more people are starting to use folks and at what level, right? This is the organization that's really at the forefront of this whole movement. 
Taproot Foundation exists in large uh, cities, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that, but I wanted to just point this out, that this is where a lot of it started. They have great videos and information, and uh, they're working with a number of folks, Board Source, LinkedIn, to help create this and connect people together. 62% of nonprofits reported that they wanted more pro bono service, but only 28% reported that they wanted the traditional volunteer. Interesting. People are starting to figure this out. The value of a pro bono volunteer can be hundreds of dollars per hour, depending on the field that they're in. The average value of a volunteer who does the direct service is about $20. But I don't want to get too focused on money because you cannot buy a good heart who provides the service that you do to the people that you're there to serve. So please understand that you can't buy the good heart and the tradition. But I want you to understand what the potential is on this other side of the, the fence. Skilled volunteering. 77% of nonprofit leaders believe that skilled volunteers could help them improve their business practices. Twelve percent are actually doing it. They're actually putting people to work to help them build their organization structure. And yet, there are forty percent of the folks out there saying, I want to do it. So we have a disconnect. We have a need and we have the people, but we haven't figured out quite yet how to put it all together. I'm working on a contract in Kansas through the Commission on Volunteerism. It's a year-long project that was funded by the federal government. My partner and I taught two days on how to do this. And then we're, we have four grantees that we're mentoring for six months. And every month, my partner and I get on the phone and we're coaching these organizations on how to do this. It's not something that we've always done. And there are people out there who might help you figure this out who are themselves volunteers. On the board side, because I'm with BoardSource, BoardSource is also working with the Taproot Foundation. They've written a book or a manual, a guide to, on how nonprofit boards can tap pro bono and in-kind services. It might be something very, very helpful. It's a download. It's a PDF. You can I, just go get it. In, t in terms of the board's responsibility, we need to be thinking about board's roles are to ensure that, they, that we have adequate resources. That's their, one of their jobs. That they have to attend meetings and functions. They have to give their own money. That's part of most board responsibilities for new board members. But also to contribute talent. You know, and having the right people with the right skills on your board and if you don't have it, go find it. All right. So when somebody's coming on your board, here's some things you might ask them. When you recruit new members, ask them about their ability to secure in-kind donations and pro bono support. Do they know people who might give their skills and talent? As part of the annual operating budget process, um, do they have functional expertise? Considering how pro bono and in-kind resource generation could be part of your next strategic planning goals. Some organizations are actually saying, in lieu of putting down 20% of our budget as cash, we're going to set a goal that will be in-kind pro bono. So they're really looking at this as a way to find additional support, and it's not just about money. Add pro bono and in-kind donors on your website and your annual report. I've seen annual reports of organizations where the word volunteer was never mentioned, right? All right, so this is what it looks like, a Vis little visual cloud here, all the kinds of things that volunteers are doing, and this came from Beyond Cash, that book that I just mentioned. You can see, and you probably already do some of this. You're getting in-kind computers. You're getting tickets for this or giving, you know, you've got a videographer. You've got advertising that's free. There's so many different ways to leverage this for your organization. So as I've said earlier, you're the best kept secret going. I know that some of you have boards that you are basically given the board member by the church or by the affiliation that you 
you know, your church affiliation. And what I'm saying is, so you've got your board, but could you have a committee of, that's a task force, pro bono task force, a skill-based task force that works off of that committee? And then could you have a little group that's focused on marketing? So you recruit three or four people from the community to work on a marketing plan for your organization that's short term that d reports back to your board. Do you see? So talk to me for a very few minutes because we don't have a lot of time. Could this work for you? Those of you that have that fixed board, the members are set by the church. Could you see yourself spinning off little ad hoc committees or task forces to do this kind of work? Right? So you're not limited. It's just a matter of rethinking how you're going to go about doing this. Um, Taproot Foundation also has some, as I said, some wonderful resources. And here's just a simple little visual of what a pro bono committee could look like or a pro bono task force. And the fact that you might want to have a technology expert who knows you know, web development, a marketing expert who might also know social media, an HR expert, and a strategic ex uh, strategist. And put these people together and say, we want to build pro bono skill-based volunteering for this organization and let them help you create it. There's also a huge initiative, and again, this comes from the Taproot collaboration with corporations throughout the United States. And what they're trying to do is to inspire corporations and small businesses to commit to doing skill-based pro bono work as charity work or whatever, you, you know, contribution to community. There's so many different things that corporations have always done, but now there's this huge, huge initiative. And I don't know if you can see this, but if you go to that website, you can actually click on these companies and you will see what they've been doing in communities all over the United States. So if you're coming from a large city, which I know many of you are, um, Deloitte, for example, is one of the leaders in skill-based pro bono work. And what they actually do is they put billable hours in their budget that will be pro bono. So click on it and see what sparks you. Because you may have these people who have already said, I'll do it, all you have to do is walk through the door. They're talking about impact. What's the impact on a business that involves their employees in the community? It's huge. And a lot of the millennial generation said, has said, we'd rather get to do this kind of stuff than necessarily have you know, a, a free cafeteria. I mean, there are lots of things that they're saying that this has great value to the employee in that generation. And so for nonprofits, it says here, and communities, the value of skilled support for general operations, technology, and professional services can be 500% greater than the traditional volunteer. And I know, having talked to you all, you all, that you're, many of you are a staff of one or a half, you know, and you may not have all of these fabulous people supporting you like you would if you were working for the Red Cross or for the American Cancer you know, Society. So why not begin to think about this as a way of adding on? There's also a new buzzword called micro-volunteering. You know, people spend a lot of time playing solitaire on their cell phones. Why not give them something meaningful to do? And so this group will help you connect to people who might design a logo, for example, or they might design a marketing message. And it's a very limited amount of time. And they are um, volunteering for your organization. This one got me excited. This is called Catch a Fire. And I really encourage you to go look at this website. Because what they've done is they have uh, matched, let me go back here. They've no, let me go this way. Catch a Fire match, matches services for skill-based volunteer. They have projects that are usually done virtually. They have a small fee for service to the nonprofit. So if you latch on to Catch a Fire, basically you're going to pay a small little fee, and then you have access to this world of virtual volunteers <coughs> with high skill level. On the other side, the volunteers with a high skill level are saying, me, 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 believe it or not, there are more people wanting to volunteer than they have matches for in the nonprofit side. 
So it's so exciting because what's happening is the average value of a contribution by those volunteers can be five to seven thousand dollars. It's usually short term. It's like getting a mini grant. Okay. So if you look at the taproot side, if you're in a big city like I think Chicago, San Francisco, and maybe DC. I, I apologize for not. Oh, there they are. Los Angeles, New York City. They have grants of up to five to six business professionals valued at up to $45,000. So you have to fill out a grant application. You have to show that you know how to leverage projects and help people and support them on a project management basis. And if you don't, you find somebody who can. And the project can last six to eight months. So tell me what you're thinking right now, because I'm just you know, throwing things out at you. Are any light bulbs starting to go on yet? Are you doing yes, no, yes, no, but more yeses, or oh my gosh, I haven't considered this, or this could be really exciting? Yes, Jason. Yeah, as I think about it, I think um, in, in my own experience, I, would, I think there's, there's a kind of resistance in, in me, even though I'm from a, a younger generation, I think. On one level, this is terrible news. That is, it just, it just grates on me, and maybe others might feel this as well. It's like, Seeing that a, a generation of, of people with time, the good hearts and the time to give, so many of the ministries need that good heart and the time. We need warm bodies to drive vans and yes. sports. And getting people, volunteers who <coughs> to volunteer for a few hours are, I don't want to say they're, they're not, I don't, they're, it's, it's just going through the process, especially in the United States, of getting them a port pass and a quick right. card and all this kind of stuff. It just seems like such a, a waste of time to invest in these things and it just seems like my initial reaction is this is it's sort of nostalgic for the good old days when there were real volunteers <laughs> and, real commitment and you could count on them and this just seems like it, I, I, was, I resist it, it, my, my sort of first gut reaction is uh, it's to manage all these people now that I have to deal with these skill based people that, that I would have to deal with that's my I have a sort of a negative reaction. So help me, um, but but I've already, ex I've certainly have already experienced this uh, and, and have, uh, you know, and, and know in my role of NAMA now, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to, even myself, uh, help the you know, mm -hmm. various skills help, help individual what What's the, help me again think what the good news in this. The good yeah, we're, we're losing those old volunteers, but what's the, yeah, help me think about what uh, to transform my, my thinking. Okay. For me, it's like I, I, I really I feel your pain because I've done this work as well. Here's an example. I'm not necessarily going to maybe answer your question, but there was a nonprofit that kept getting volunteers who were wanting to get involved in marketing and social media and all that, but what they desperately needed were volunteers to sit at the, the desk and work with the clients who were coming in the door. And they had money for a marketing person, and what they finally decided was they were going to have to flip it. And they took the money for the marketing and bought two administrative clerical support people to do the work that the volunteers had been doing, and now they've got the volunteers doing the marketing. So the question is, <laughs> if you had somebody who could tell your story better, would you have more volunteers who would do the driving? Because if I can't find you, I don't know you need drivers. If, I, if you're not doing outreach in the community because you're a staff of one and you can't get to all these organizations, can you get that Speakers Bureau to go out and get people excited about driving and what the fun things that happen when you meet all of these amazing people? Does that answer? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that comes to me, I know this is sort of, I just perceive this to be the truth. I know this is the trend. It's I coming. Know, whether we're, I think are facing it. And so it's, it's more, how do we harness it rather than sort of resist it and just be sad that, that it seems the world is changing? It's changing, but it's, there will always be people who will want to drive. There will always be people who want to visit. But what I'm hearing is you, the capacity of your organizations are being diminished because you have so few staff you have boards that don't necessarily know fundraising or, you know, because they're being assigned or, you know, they're caught back in that old world 
where things were always good. And it's like, when I put that slide up, ride the horse in the direction it's going, this is the direction. How do we leverage it to our advantage? Yes, sir, you had a comment. We have, all of us have the problem of volunteers after 9-11 and the changes, whether it's inside or outside. Mm -hmm. uh, the logistics of getting the volunteer, the, the expense of a toy card, you have to look at something on a long-term right. basis rather than those short-terms, and the volunteers are fine. That's all well and great. Uh, the bottom line, I, I've got a dysfunctional board, just like everybody else in here. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we are working on it. We are correcting our board. But, but the bottom line, and that was said several times yesterday for every one of these seafarer centers, is money. The bottom line is budget and money. When I'm looking at this and I'm trying to look ahead and I'm trying to, to get out of my dinosaur mind and, and change and get with the times, when I see a $5,000 savings a year from pro bono, it's like I challenged our staff the other day to find a way to save me to make me $5 a day, each one of them. That's $1,800 and something dollars a year. Three staff, I've got a savings of five or $6,000 a year. I would love for somebody to go, I'm gonna write you a $5,000 check every year. That, that, you know, those add up. When I'm looking at this, I have to kind of put on my blinders and eliminate all the other stuff and go down to the bottom line budget. If I could find three pro bono companies that are gonna take some weight off of my back, give me time to spend better on other projects, and then save me in value, in equal value, barter value, if that's what you want to call right. it, uh, $15,000 a year. That's like somebody writing me a check and giving me a vacation. Okay, and can I say, if you're, go if you're working with a large company, how many people in that company now know about your organization who become potential donors and or who, you know, the company may support with some project down the road? You know, you're building a network of support and it's, you know, and this is part of that process. And uh, let me just say, I wouldn't, I would just take one thing, one simple thing and try it, you know, and see what happens. And where are you most weak? And I suspect a lot of you would say, people don't know about us. Okay, yes. The, I, I hear Jason and I, and I, he beat me to the pain that I was going to express. <laughs> <laughs> because it for us it's always a challenge of where do you find the time to manage the volunteers you so desperately need it's sort of this catch yes two thing but at the same time um, I think this this requires a, a cultural shift in any organization you have to stop thinking in terms of um, very much as you've expressed the, the $5,000 um, for an individual, think instead of maybe if you if you can get yourself there, um, instead of this is going to free up somebody like the ED who does have the time and the expertise to go out and get fifteen thousand um, dollars. If you can get this to work for you, and uh, I can testify to that. I have. Another example sitting across here from me of a volunteer came to our agency, Father Ron, and has ended up becoming an employee. Mm -hmm. And um, so that can happen too. And, it, and it's a way of finding the right people and filling the gaps. Okay, and I have this uh, per person and the two of you, then I want to, I know that we have a few minutes for Q&A. I want to just draw a few conclusions and then we'll open it back up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you can reach a happy medium. But um, I'm involved with another conference next week, the National Deacons Conference, and there's a lot of typing and whatever. My daughter's company, she works for a, a, a consulting company, and they encourage their employees exactly. to go out and volunteer. And actually, they give you bonuses dependent on getting the physical practice of volunteering in. So she's now doing all the typing for the conference. And meanwhile, she gets to choose where the $500 donation that they also make does, and that's coming to my mission. So it can be a win-win situation. 
It absolutely is because the employee's getting value, the company's getting recognition, and you're getting the job done. And let me go to this gentleman over here. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I, I want to speak something about uh, the Chinese American community. And uh, uh, myself is a baby boomer, and uh, I'm first generation immigrants in the United States. I got saved uh, and become Christian uh, in this country. And uh, what I've observed that uh, in my generation, the first generation immigrants, that uh, we kind of uh, very much. Uh, Feeling uh, less secure, you know, financially, career-wise, you know, so those of us uh, work very hard to maintain our jobs, positions, uh, financial securities. I find our, our next generation, you know, our younger generation, my son, daughters, uh, they have different views. I find them uh, probably be more secured, and they claim themselves as pure Americans. You know, sometimes we want to inject the Chinese philosophy or culture into them. They will say, hey, daddy, mom, this is uh, American. I am American. Right. I, I'm proud of them, but uh, in the same time, find out that uh, they're more willing to do volunteer work. Yes. I find out a lot of the uh, second generation Chinese Americans who go out uh, after graduation from college, not looking for a job, and just want to do volunteer works working for, uh, you know, different non-profit organizations. Right, absolutely. It has become a, a very good trend. It you know, is, a, it is yes. part of their value system as a yeah, generational a value. Yeah, yes. Uh, to me, I'm, I'm kind of uh, more optimistic good. in that, that generation. Yeah. So, so the question is, and I know we're, thank you, sir, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. The, the question is, you know, how are we going to create this system going forward? You had a comment? Uh, just along, I was question for you in, in, in what Maggie said about her daughter's company volunteering. Uh, I had a phone call completely out of the blue last year from Zurich Insurance saying they require their companies to volunteer and they hadn't found a place. Yes. Could they come and volunteer for us? We had 23 people give us four hours apiece in one afternoon. They brought their own lunch and they just did everything that we had to do. We had a big event two days later, so they literally cleaned up my building and did a lot of stuff like that. But how do we get it tapped into that? Because these are major companies. Okay, so remember the billion plus change. You're going to go to that website. You're going to look and see if there are any of those corporations. Um, you're going to also potentially find them on LinkedIn. And so I've given you a link, uh, the nonprofit.linkedin.com, and you can post your opportunity there and you can explore resources. So basically what it says is you're going to draft a compelling description starting with the word volunteer so that it, the search engine finds you and it will basically take you right through the steps and so you've got the posting here and then it shows you how to search by keywords so in this particular instance you were looking for a graphic designer and you, you may actually if you know like you have a Deloitte in your community you would type in Deloitte graphic designer and the location and it will pull up people who may be potential resources for you. So there are many, many ways to begin finding these people. And let me go back to that whole point of pain about supervision. It's like find somebody to be that person in your organization, a volunteer, who may have had executive background or who may have been a major HR supervisor type. Find them first to help you build a new team. All right? Okay, and I'm almost. We've had discussions Okay, so the, I, there's one other piece I wanted to re recommend that you go to. It's called the Readiness Roadmap. You can see the the uh, link to that at the bottom. This will help take you through, you know, like a tutorial on how to begin thinking on this culture shift that we've been talking about. Help you walk through the steps. So some of the potential barriers you've already been discussing. You know, we don't have a vision yet. You know, we have to create that vision and think about it. We're not sure how we're going to design the work for these short-term people yet. We may not be comfortable sharing our own work. It's like it's my, my, mine. <laughs> you know, I don't want to share it. Um, I want help, but I don't want their input. You know, just do as I say, not as I do. The fear of risk and liability or confidentiality. I mean, we put up all kinds of reasons why this may not work, many of which are valid and some of which aren't. 
So I challenge you to begin having this discussion, you know, to begin looking at where we might begin to open the door a little bit. And I'm going to skip through here. So very quickly, are there any questions? And at this point, it's like, what do you think? How are you feeling right now? What can we do about this? Comment, and I have two minutes. Let's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>